Welcome everyone to Doing Business with a Servant's Heart podcast. Doing business in life with a purpose, serving others and achieving success by helping others. I'm your host, Steve Ramon, and we created this show for you because we want everyone to learn how to do business in life to make an impact in the world. And it might be your own little world as well, but just making an impact. I want you to think about as you're listening to my guests today, how will you serve and what impact will you create? And speaking of serving and impacting, he actually did serve. He was in the restaurant industry and he literally served food to people. And food is a subject I love. Me and my wife love going out and trying new food or tasting the food we love. But we're going to go into an area I think you guys could all be excited to learn about. Dan, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having me. What got you in the restaurant industry? Oh, you know, I, I that's a long story, but it's <laughs> uh, I've always wanted to be a chef and finally ended up being, I went to uh, pre-med, all that. And then finally, I was just like, you know what? I want to cook for a living. So that's what I ended up doing. So you went from pre-med to chef. That's quite a difference. Yeah. Well, you know, it's like I was actually uh, down there in University of Houston and we were measuring the rate of photosynthesis in chlorophyll. And it was a Saturday. I was all by myself measuring this for, you know, uh, in one of the classes I did. And I'm like, dude, I, I don't want to do this. I want to, this is, it's like, that's not what I want to do the rest of my life. I want to cook. So that's when I decided I was going to cook and, um, you know, the rest is history. So yeah. it's, uh, it's more about, you know, if I look back on it, it's about serving, you know, I can, you make people happy. And who does that? What's the what's some of the fun things about being a chef, and what are some of the not so fun things about being a chef? Well, the fun things is is you get to create what what you want, and you eat what you want, and you know I, it's like that Bluebell commercial, which I don't, uh, not plugging them, but you know you you eat all you can and you sell the rest. Is <laughs> it's uh, you know you get to try stuff or make stuff and and with the level that I worked at with the people I worked at, the professional chefs, it, when you get something that's perfect, it's like a piece of bacon out of the oven is better than it sitting in the warmer. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, true. a piece of meat that's just rested in, and sauce just perfect it, you know, and it, and you, you try it. It's like, wow. And then you put it in the window and it sits there and then it goes to the table or it sits on the buffet. It's not the same. And you know, that, that whole thing, that visceral dopamine hit that, you know, you get the first bite. Yeah, I, I love that. That's an interesting way of looking at it. What was your expertise? Or, you know, what was the food uh, that you liked cooking that you were really good at or enjoyed? Well, a lot, I've cooked all kinds, but, okay. you know, really a lot of it was French. I really liked the French food, hmm. uh, the techniques, you know, because that translates into a lot of different things. But also yeah. like, you know, the Indian and Moroccan and... I, all kinds. And, and I worked in a country club, so we had the opportunity to learn and do so many different things. That's what made a uh, country club was really cool about that is you got to do, you know, borscht and, you know, you studied it and you learned about it. And then you took tests and you trained and you took classes and, you know, all this information and you actually produced it for the members. And, and it was like, wow, this is, this is great. I love that. And so you would do different kinds of foods as it came in, in the country club. Hey, this month we're going to do this food. So you got to do different talents, I guess you would say, right? Right. And sometimes you, you know, you do the different um, weeks, you know, we'd have like a uh, lobster week or we would do mm -hmm. uh, sushi week or whatever. And then you, you actually got to do all those. So that was really cool. Call you utility, your utility player chef. Like in baseball, utility player because plays every position. You could do multiple different foods, which is really awesome. If I was going to be a chef, that's what I'd love. And, and I'm asking all these because, audience, it leads to this. Uh, you wrote a book, Dan, I'm very excited to learn more about because this is probably all over, especially after COVID. Talk about the book and what your mission was with the book. Well, the book is called Deliberate Evolution. And really, it, it started with me being... 300 pounds. I looked at a picture of me at my best friend's wedding. And I was like, who is that? I didn't recognize myself because I'd got so far out of whack because we don't we don't notice ourselves going off course until we look at a picture and we're like, how do we end up there? And really, that's what sparked it all. And then I, I decided 
I wanted to run a Spartan race. I read uh, David Goggins or listened to David Goggins book, you know, and I got inspired by that. And I actually lost 70 pounds and ran my first Spartan race. I, that was January one. And I ran my first Spartan race in October of that year um, at 50, 50 some years old after being 300 pounds. And, and it was so surreal. It's like he talks about, you know, you visualize what you want. You visualize that moment. And I visualize the smell because you watch the videos and you could see them jumping over the fire at the very end. So I envisioned the smell and the feeling and all that and put all that in there. And I got to that point. And when I was jumping over it, I went with my sister. She, she ran a whole bunch of Spartan races. She went with me and it was so surreal that moment as I was jumping over that, that all came back and just flooded me. And I'm like, dude, I'm here. I'm here where I, put my potential at i made it to that point what an emotional roller coaster from chef popular chef we'll get you 300 pounds look in the mirror going this ain't good you drop down and you fire right and in less than a year you've changed your emotions which are hard to do right well but the the point the all that was cool and all that i'm like oh cool i'm done I, i've got all this but then the the mental part came back mm. my my past came back and got me and a lot of times, if we don't go back to our past and accept it, it holds us captive. Yeah. And I actually ran into uh, being sexually traumatized at six. And it finally put the ground zero into my life of understanding what really happened. And it, it's like, you know, now I know where the speech impediment at six came from. Nobody knew where it came from. And, you know, it took three years to get over that and the the bullying from that and then the coping mechanism was food so i started eating a lot because that, you you when you can't process something you fall on coping mechanisms and the food so i grew very rapidly so i was very awkward and you know that increases the bullying and and all that and you know and then that turns into the alcohol and it turns into the drugs and then it turns into um where a lot of people can't can't get out of it you know i fought for it the the coping mechanisms of the drug and alcohol all my my life until i got to that point and then it was like wow this is wow i understand it now you mm -hmm. know you can't you can't understand your life going through it you can under, only understand it looking back yeah. and and that's when i was like you know i have to i have to tell people about this this was life-changing for me what if i would have learned this when i was 30 what if I'd have learned this when I was 40 or even 20? Yeah. What if I would have learned this and gone back and dealt with it then? How far have I would I have gotten in my career and in life? You know, how far could I have gotten? Yeah. Because our yeah. potential is very limited by what we think of ourselves. And that that's that whole point is, you know, the, the whole book, Deliberate Evolution. Evolution is is. Uh, really by chance it's you know like an oak tree it produces enough different variations that some of them are going to survive mm -hmm. it takes generation and generation generation to to see that but what if we're deliberate about our evolution as a person what what could we do instead of because you know we get to a certain point and we keep making mistakes it's if you look at an airplane and it, it's it takes off and it's it's one degree off for every degree it's off in 60 miles this is just you know there's so many different factors but theoretically it's one mile off after 60 miles wow but what if you keep going how far are you off it's like if i think if you fly from los angeles and you're one degree off and you're flying to london you end up like in two uh you end up in africa I mean, Great it's story. that bad. And, and and if we look at the decisions we make and our decisions are, everybody looks at your decision is, is this microsecond, you know, it's like you make your decision, but what if you could control it? And it wasn't a reaction. It was a re response. And the whole book is really defining what goes into that millisecond. It's like there's, you have to do the work beforehand. You have to be deliberate before you get in a situation that'll change your life. Yeah. And it's amazing your story. And thank you for sharing the bullying and everything that happened to you. A little, you know, people go, oh, bullying's not, it's a huge deal. And in your case, it's a monstrous deal. But awareness sounds like a big thing 
as part of this too, being aware of stuff, right? Oh yeah. I mean, it's that self-awareness and mm-hmm. we have to, if we want to evolve, we have to be self-aware of everything that we've done. We have to be cognizant of our strong points and our weak points. And mm-hmm. a lot of times the book that I wrote was really for leaders. And it's not that anybody couldn't do this because it's great for anybody, but if I can affect a leader, then they can affect more people. But also like a leader, the reason that somebody is successful most of the time is because they had something in their past that made them, they weren't good enough. Uh, They weren't included. They were bullied. They, they had traumas. Um, They had, you know, they weren't the person that, they were rejected. And so they always want to prove themselves. And that's how they become, you know, these great leaders. We look, we look at their past and we look at their past. There's just enough for it to drive them, but not destroy them. Yeah. But then you look at people like me where it's enough that, you know, you get to that point and what got you to the party is what's going to destroy you. Yeah. And that's that point where, you know, in chefs, you get the coping mechanisms and you get the divorce and the alcoholism and the, you know, you die from heart attack because you don't eat right and all these other things. But what if you could get to that point and be successful, but then realize the same thing that got you there was is going to be the same thing that will destroy you if you don't go yeah. back and accept it and learn from it and use it. You get power from being rejected. You get power from sexual trauma and and it sounds funny and people don't think of it like that but like what i got from it is is something i always hid from was empathy after i found that then i could empathize with other people yeah but before that that was one of the things i i totally avoided was empathy you know i was very stoic very um angry very whatever I, i don't really care about it but really deep down it's because I felt people didn't care about me. So I didn't care about people. Yeah. And everybody, you know, if you weren't recognized and you always, you you always want to prove yourself. And, but it gets to a point to where in your being a leader, you can only go so high because you don't go back and accept and get the power that got you there and realize it's like the horsepower that drove the car will kill you if you don't control it. Yeah. But if you harness it, uh, the possibilities, the potential that you have is, is it's astronomical what your potential is. Yeah, and potential is a good word. And I love your leadership rising. A lot of them hit ceilings. And a lot of it's because of the past, like you said. Um, and, and the plane story, what, I, what I'm learning is so powerful is, yeah, it's off a percent and it goes 60 miles or a mile every 60 miles. But guess what? You can recorrect that. And that's what you're doing, correct? Correcting it all your past to make it a superpower for you. Right. Well, I mean, you have to realize you're, you're a lot of people, they get, they have goals mm-hmm. and, and you're multitasking. Multitasking is, is a lie. You can't multitask especially with your life. You have to have one goal. Yes, you can have many goals, but they need to roll up into that one umbrella. Mm -hmm. But it's like, if you, let's say in a week, you have every week you make one decision and there's two outcomes and there's 52 weeks in a year. Mm -hmm. You know, people think, okay, it's not that big of a deal, but at the end of those 52 weeks, I think it's like 4 trillion outcomes is what the 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 equation because you every time you do it you you the number squares so by week 52 there's four trillion different outcomes for your life because of one decision made once a week with two choices that's 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 phenomenal yeah and it's like until you go back and you figure it out you you got to have one distinct clear measuring stick to make a decision. And if you do that, then, I mean, even if you did it for half the weeks, then you would only be like 4 million different choices. But what if you had every week that you made a decision, you had a clear defined measuring stick. It's like, will it make the boat go faster? And if it doesn't, we don't do it. 
And that, that came from the 1990 Olympic, uh, the British Olympic team, where they always lost. They weren't the biggest, the strongest, the fastest, the quickest. But what they did is they came up with a question. They asked every single thing they did. It's like, will it make the boat go faster? Hmm. It's like going to the pub. Will it make the boat go faster? No. So we're not going to the pub. Will this hard workout make the boat go faster? Oh, yeah. So we're going to do that. And what if you did have that defined question for your life and you made it every single time you had to make, it, make a decision? Then you're actually squaring the number one. And at, at 52 weeks, there's only one outcome. What if? You could do that. I mean, that's that's the whole book wrapped up in in in, yeah. in 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 one thing is like defining your decisions. You know, the the book it's it's the journey of discovering, embracing one's true self to influence one's path in life actively. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Wow. I, what if we could do that? Yeah. No. Decision, and I love it because decisions are such a. Uh, uh, a problem for, it's probably the wrong word, but a problem for people. I talk to people, I'm indecisive. Should I do this? And that's the worst thing you can do. And I love you keep talking about decision. Make that one decision to uh, keep making them and just like the plane, recorrect if it's a decision that doesn't go the right way. If they went to the pub, okay, we're not going to do that again. It didn't help us go faster. They learned. And that what you're saying, because your life from January 1st to October, talk about decisions making. The one turned to two. You did the same thing, correct? Oh yeah. So you lived it. Yeah. I mean, the, the funny part about writing the book and about writing that is, is I've actually evolved from the first time I wrote the book. And, and even after writing the book, going through the edits, the whole theory of this evolved because then I could start, you know, yes, I wrote it down, but then I could start seeing between the lines, the meanings, it's like, yes, I got it out. I put it on paper. And then it's like, I start applying it. And I'm like, wow, you know, it's like, this is, this is more than those words that are on that page. And that's when it starts morphing into something else. Yeah. And, you know, it goes from being, yeah, here's the six stops every leader must make to live a life of success. And really it's like it, the title, I wrote it so long ago. It's like the meaning it has now wasn't the same meeting I had yeah. when I wrote it. It's a life of success. It doesn't say successful career. It doesn't say successful uh, marriage. It says a life of success. And the whole book goes in to you defining, going on a journey to define what success is for you and then harnessing it and taking it. And then you're successful no matter what anybody else says because other people's opinion of you is none of your business. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Oh, I love you said that. I learned a phrase two years ago. What you think about me is none of my business. Falls yeah, exactly. in line. <laughs> right. Because I'm sure people during that January 1st to October, you were getting input from everywhere. Good, bad. Why are you doing that? Oh, you can't do it. Yes, you can do it. But you didn't care what they said. You followed your path. And how important is tracking? You know, you, you wrote that book, but during that whole time, did you write stuff down? as you're going from January 1st to October to run that Spartan race? Um, really, I, was, I started writing after after the race yeah. because that's when I fell into that mental uh, quagmire of uh, because I, I, I was drawn to these books and, and I was drawn to this one audio book. It was uh, Bessel uh, Vanderkoff. It's The Body Remembers the Score or The Body Keeps Score. And he is a specialist in childhood traumas. And I don't know why I got drawn to that book, mm -hmm. but that's the book that triggered it. I mean, I was just sitting in this chair and it just triggered it. And that's when everything came flooding back. And I was like, I have to, and, and it was getting out of that hole. And that was the same time COVID hit. So, you know, I was going to do more Spartan races, but they canceled all the Spartan races. Mm -hmm. So trying to keep in shape and then the mental, that funk and all that, I fell back into it. So did I keep off the 70 pounds? No, but I kept off 50 of them, which is, and that's four, four years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like, now it's like, now I'm starting to get back into, you know, when, when you, you start doing something again, it's like the diet that worked the first time doesn't work. The, the exercise program that worked the first time doesn't work because of injuries. You know, I have I, I, I had to do PT for my knee because I got injured again. 
So it's like all these different things you have to evolve past. Uh, what was it? Babe Ruth said, yesterday's home runs will not win today's games. <laughs> and what phrase. work used to work is we have to stop doing it. We have to stop beating our head against the wall and do something and evolve into the next version of ourselves right. so that we can keep moving up and getting better and better and better by our own standards, not everybody right. else's, but our standards. Yeah. And if you're not a leader listening to this, this app works for you too. Because we're always evolving. And I'm talking about business pivoting and COVID or people's personal life pivoting. We were indoors for a long period of time. We're hybrid and all, we'll get into all that. So why I love your book, the evolution word is huge lesson for people who are always changing. And you're prepping yourself for the change using what you experienced in the past. And now you're sharing it out so people don't have to recreate the wheel. Here's what I went through. Read the book and I'll walk you through these steps. Correct? Am I re reading this right? Yeah. So if you go in the book, um, it's on Amazon, but you can go in there. And so each of the six steps actually has an exercise for each one. Mm -hmm. And it has reflective questions because if you ask enough questions, you can get enough answers so that you can make an informed decision. But you you have to be prompt because we can't sit here and, and ask ourselves questions we have to be prompt because other people, what other people went through, because we're not the first person to struggle with the human condition. We're not. So if we go back and we have the questions that prompt us to think about ourselves in a way that we never thought about, then we're going to get results we never had. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's so true. We're getting to the end of the time here. This went fast, really fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I love that. It's great shows like this always do that. What's any last uh, parting words you want to leave the audience about what you're doing and about the book? Um, well, you can find the books on Amazon. Okay. Um, you, I have a website. You go to it. It's easy, www.dancapello.com. And you can go on there. There's actually a deliberate life checklist you can go on there. And it, it's just a, a primer to get you thinking. Um, but you can get the book. And I was actually dyslexic, or I'm still kind of dyslexic. And the only thing that changed my life was Audible. So I actually had someone read it for me in Audible. So you can actually get my book on Audible so you can listen to it in the car. It's just over three hours. And and so you can get the ebook, the, e the book, or the Audible. And, you know, that's it. Really, it's if you start on that journey, it's going to draw you in because you're going to figure out what makes you tick and that that's what we we all need and you yeah. know like you said it's not just for leaders because we're all leaders of ourselves and if we can't lead ourselves we can't lead other people yeah family life your your eight to five worker you your peer yeah it, and i'm glad you said that that's really important um so with regards to people reaching out to you they can do that on the dancapello.com website yeah, so a, you can click on there and and uh, there's contact information. Um, you know, my my email, if anybody wants to email me, is in the back of the book. Good, perfect. There's contact information and there's also ways that you can use the book as an individual, as a company, as a school. There, there's actually ways to use the book in the back of the book. So it's it's it gives you all the information and it tells you how to use it. And where that's a tool, can. right? That's a toolkit people need. You know, books are great. You know, I think of Grow Rich. He doesn't, but that's a whole different genre of what you're doing. And I love that. Uh, Dan, thank you for being on and giving us such great wisdom to this audience. Um, as I say with every podcast, listen to this over and over. Dan hits some million dollar points, seriously, personally and professionally, that you want to make sure you grab on and understand. And that's the power of a podcast. Jump on it and then fast forward or move back and listen to that over and over. It's how we learn with repetitive uh, educating. Um, also, don't forget about my TV show. It's every Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern. It's called Together We Serve. It's on Apple TV, Roku, and all that. And I want to thank you all for watching. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Doing Business with a Servant's Heart. Thank you all.